You are watching programming from the East West Center in Washington, D.C. Which we are doing in cooperation with the United States Embassy in the Philippines in Manila. And this joint program has brought a number of leading uh, rising generation security scholars from the Philippines to us, including Ms. Morales and uh, others, and we've been doing a series of programs and they've been writing publications uh, and interviewing American officials, American experts, and getting an American perspective to inform their own views and their own work um, as they go back and help shape their country's views, perspectives, and policies on regional issues. So it's great pleasure and with great gratitude to the U.S. Embassy in Manila uh, for this very unique and special program. And of course to Ms. Morales for her outstanding role here. She's been wonderful not only as a colleague here at the East West Center in Washington, but has been active by going out and interviewing experts around town, uh, our officials and others. And online today we have, you have her full bio here, so I, I really don't want to take too much time go going through her. Um, academic background, because you, you have it right here. Um, and a longtime friend and colleague who I haven't seen for, for quite some time, too long, is Romel uh, Vanilloy. He's joining us online. Romel, wonderful to see you. Um, I, it's been way too long, and I know it's quite late in the evening. So uh, true uh, thanks to you for being willing to be a discussant here today. Uh, I'm really looking forward to your thoughts. So the format is very simple for this program, um, um, is we're going to invite Ms. Morales to give about 30 minutes, and she's informed me that she has a PowerPoint, which will take about 30 minutes or so, and she'll go through that, and then I'll invite Ramel to uh, make some comments um, as he wishes, and then we'll open it up to Q&A, and we have a kind of a hard break at noon uh, due to some other appointments, but again, thank you for joining us. The East West Center, again, always welcomes um, having folks here to join in our programs, ask questions, make comments. Uh, and I welcome all of the folks online as well, because I know there are viewers who are joining us online. So with that, welcome to you all. And particular welcome, Ms. Morales. Thank Please. you, Dr. Limay. Um, good morning. Mayung um, Buntag. Before I start with my presentation, please allow me to extend my gratitude to the U.S. Embassy in the Philippines and the East West Center in Washington for this opportunity. I would also like to thank everyone uh, for taking your time to attend this event and of course to Professor Badlawi and our online attendees for staying up late, especially those in the Philippines and other parts in Asia. Thank you very much. Okay, so my this is a work in prog progress actually, so most of the data that I am going to present are those that are uh, safe for, for, to be presented in a public uh, <laughs> forum or discussion like this. Uh, some I need to, you know, um, uh, how do you call that? Filter, synthesize, uh, and then I need to also ask permission from those people that I, you know, interviewed especially when I cite those uh, 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 information or excerpts from the transcript that I've, I've, I've done with this uh, interview. So um, my, my, my work is entitled, this is still a working title, New War, New War in the South China Sea, Framing uh, China's Unrestricted Warfare and the Role of the U.S. Indo-Pacific Strategy. So there are three major themes in this presentation. Mm -hmm. New war, unrestricted warfare, and the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy. Okay, so uh, over the past decades, uh, the Philippines has experienced, of course, uh, the incremental or gradual uh, military uh, encroachment and reclamation of the Chinese over areas where the, Ch the Philippines are claiming sovereign rights. So it started with, of course. Uh, the mischief reef. I'm sorry, where is this? Should be presented sure. later, but I am going to start with the mischief reef. Yeah, yeah uh, it started in 1994 1995. That was the first standoff between the Philippines and the Chinese forces when the Philippines uh, posted China, uh, military installations in the Panganiban or the mischief reef within the Philippines uh, 200 nautical miles exclusive economic zone. So uh, with the, the installation of, of military posts, 
that's set to protect uh, Chinese fishermen, it created the first incident between the Chinese and the Philippine authorities. This was followed by, of course, the infamous uh, standoff between the CMS and the Philippine, uh, the, the, the Philippine Navy, I mean, in uh, April 12, 2012. I'm not mistaken yet. So this has, uh, the standoff has caused a lot of implications for Philippine foreign policy, particularly its national security, because the Philippines has to recalibrate from internal to external security threats because for a long time we've been so focused with internal threats, insurgencies, terrorism in Mindanao, so on and so forth. So we have neglected at some point external security, particularly concerns in the South China Sea. So after the standoff, Pinoy, the former President Pinoy issued AO29, naming areas in the in uh, areas in the South China Sea that we are claiming sovereign rights, the Reed Bank or the Red Bank, Scarborough Shoal or the Bajo de Masinlo, and the uh, Pagasa Island and areas in the Spratly Island Group as the West Philippine Sea. So these areas are part of uh, the Philippine sovereign rights. So the rest, then they call that the South China Sea, okay? Just to make sure that the South China Sea and the West Philippine Sea may not be may, may not be the same, but at some point the West Philippine Sea is within the South China Sea. So we're not claiming the entire South China Sea here. Anyway, so followed by the standoff, 2001, during the heights of the pandemic onwards, we have seen the sprawling strategy of fishing militias in the West Philippine Sea, particularly in Whitsun Reef or uh, Julian, Philippi, uh, Phil, yeah, Julian Philippi Reef, no, so more than 2,000 uh, fishing militias were seen sprawling in the area and they conduct reconnaissance uh, tactic units, gather information and impede the freedom of navigation in the West Philippine Sea. So Whitsun Reef is around 175 nautical miles from the Philippine coast, so it is within our exclusive economic zone. Ma'am, what's the different distance between Whitsun Reef and Reef Bank? Oh, I forgot to like okay. present a map. I'm sorry. No, quite all right. I, did, I just wondered if the hostility is what had an intent to link those those two things. Oh, okay, but uh, what, you're you're asking about Panganiban Reef, right? Because Panganiban Reef is no longer within the the how do you call that the area that that is uh, under the responsibility of the Philippines because it has been already uh, completely proclaimed by China. So it's one of the first, I mean, one of the islands that China has completed its military installations. I guess my, my question is that by, by the distance, I guess, yeah. Can, can we, of course, please. Please. The presentation. I'm sorry, we'll I must have missed, I'm sorry, ma'am, I must have missed to like present, I, I should have presented a map. No, but no, if I have a time later that I can show, if we can look for a map regarding that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you. And then, of course, the recent incident in February 3, 2023, the alleged military laser incident between the, uh, the, the Chinese Coast Guard and the Philippine Coast Guard. So this has, already, this has been one of the issues that hurt, of course, uh, the international community, the Philippines, the United States, and other uh, state partners of the Philippines because of the blatant uh, disregard of, of Chinese of the Chinese government of uh, international law. So the alleged, quote unquote, military laser incident. So thank you. I'm going to proceed so uh, to my next presentation. So all those incidents, I categorize or describe those as new wars. So what is a new war? So new war, according to its proponent, uh, Mary Caldor, new wars are fought by networks of state and non-state actors which include three main categories, mainly insurgencies, autonomous militias, particularly those who side uh, the government, and coalition of government or blocs, alliances. No? So most of the units that are involved in new wars are combined military and non-military assets. No? So they are involved in war fighting. Uh, globalization, of course, created the new forms or new modalities of communication like new media, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, so on and so forth, TikTok, these are all, kind of, uh, all kinds of new media. So making the exchange of information easier, cheaper, and relatively accessible. So resulting in a globalized local conflict, 
even among netizens. So if you are looking at some postings or those uh, Twitter accounts, so a lot of how do you call that? Uh, ongoing debates are happening. So now they use uh, how do you call this one? Information to cancel or shame the other person. So that sort of uh, in this kind of, 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 of technology creates bullying. So that's kind of a new war. But in this case, I'm looking at state actors and non-state actors, okay? So in intensifying global uh, network uh, that is connected, of course, by state and non-state actors, migrants, NGOs, journalists, ordinary citizens, and even netizens, no? So, and then, of course, a spread of fear or panic used by terrorist organizations. So, the newness of new war relies heavily on the accessibility of information brought by the new modalities or, or modes of communication, you know, like what I said. Uh, this made, uh, I'm sorry, oops, this made new wars relatively or perhaps new. But there are, of course, criticisms about the newness of new war. But uh, so before that, I would like to present a matrix here just to describe the difference between what is new war versus what is an old war. So for old war, the reasons of war particularly are more on colonization of uh, or acquisition of territories and the consolidation of territorial sovereignty. For new wars, you have identity politics, uh, communal politics, particularly happening in India, elsewhere in the Middle East, in South Asia, or even Southwest Asia. Protection of borders and territories, occupying un uninhabited areas like what's happening in the South China Sea, and of course challenging the status quo or the international order. Spaces of war, for old wars it is clear, the battlefield or the zone of peace are, are most likely territories or borders. But with new war, it has become borderless. It blurs zones of peace and war. So you can no longer identify which is or which is not a battlefield. No? So it domesticizes, like what China is doing, domesticized international spaces or yeah like the South China Sea. These are uninhabited area and it's not domiciled essentially by people. Apart from the Pagasa Island, which is the northernmost part of the Philippine archipelago as stated by PD, uh, the, the presidential decree issued by Marco Senior during uh, the eighties. Okay? Warring parties or units you have states represented by military troops, professional military uh, uh, units. But for new war, still you have the state presented by its armed forces, but of course you have non-state uh, non, uh, non units like militias, you know, and even state sponsoring terrorism, you know? vigilantes, crimes, and of course human and non-human uh, uh, assets or post-human warfare. I'm referring, referring to AI, robots, in the near future perhaps zombies. Okay. Modes of war, uh, yeah, zombies. I've been teaching my students, what would be the right in conferred to zombies? Should we confer right to zombies in the event of a zombie apocalypse? <laughs> Exposed human warfare. Okay, so modes of war, conventional warfare, which is very evident during transitional or even during the classical transitional Cold War period, total war, nuclear war. And then modes of war for new wars, you have hybrid warfare, informatized uh, or information warfare, and in this case, unrestricted warfare. And some scholars, they refer to that as gray zone coercion or gray zone campaign. But in this case, gray zone coercion or gray zone campaign is just one, one of the major approaches of China's unrestricted warfare, okay? <coughs> Sources of finances, states, of course, for old wars. New wars, you still have the states, but of course, you have capitalist networks like the, MIS, the, the military industrial complexes, complexes I mean, and non state units. Terrorism, for example, terrorist groups, they have a bunch of like uh, funding coming from the black market. Uh, policy response, of course, alliances, blocks, counterbalancing, and transnational organization. Even the concept of the Indo Pacific strategy and uh, the force posturing, all these concepts still are very. Uh, how do you call that? Conventional in a sense when we refer to old war. But of course, 
when we provide the context of a cosmopolitan humanism that coming from the policy approach proposed by Mary Caldor, then we could at some point center you know, individual rights in the context or in the concept of Indo-Pacific strategy. Because that is one of the, res or that's the major response in terms of new wars on how we address uh, threats to international security. Okay? So now I'm moving on to China's new war, China's unrestricted warfare. This is actually two books that I've read during my entire program here in uh, East West Center, thanks to Lance there for being so patient with me. Well, sometimes I report here, or I don't report because I need to read, you know. So I have to like, con how do you call this, categorize four major themes in that particular uh, Chinese book translated to English. So the translation is very difficult with you, with your loss in, trans in the translation part. So there are four themes. You have the first one, combination of strategies. So China has mastered its combination of strategies. Uh, uh, including its economic leverage in Asia, most particularly, you know, its uh, military preponderance in the South China Sea, as well as the militarization of its oil uh, shipping routes. Uh, that's why it has its Belt and Road Initiative. And then the strengthening of its cultural and public diplomacy to people, uh, to people exchange. I myself, in fact, is a recipient of all of this uh, public uh, or student exchanges or scholar exchanges of China. And then learn a lot from the Chinese, uh, how they think, their foreign policy and their strategy. Huh? So that's a combination of strategies. So with that, sorry, uh, see. Uh, so China's unrestric unrestricted warfare actually starts with the combination of its military and non-military assets. So the operation of the use of military and non-military coercion is the start of its unrestricted warfare or this so-called gray zone coercion. So they use fishing militias as reconnaissance tactic units that gather information and then impedes freedom of navigation in the Indo-Pacific or especially in the South China Sea. You know? So that's the combination of strategies. Uh, Apart from that, you have the, that's the first part. The second one is the, consoli the, the consolidation of all its maritime agencies. Mm -hmm. When we refer to that, to, the, those, to this maritime agencies as the, the five dragons. You have the Chinese maritime surveillance and the Coast Guard, you have the maritime police, you know, so and even the mapping and the fishing area consolidated into one, okay? And then secondly, you have the, what do you call that? The this these five dragons actually support you know, the, the 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 reclamation of uninhabited areas you know, in the in the in the South China Sea. What some of my respondents would refer to this that they exhaust the concept of Terra Nullius, one of my interviews. Now that's actually China's gray zone. So gray zone uh, coercion. And then lastly of course the civilianization of the the, the People's Liberation, or the Navy, the, the PLAN. Now the PLAN support, uh, they support actively the activities of uh, civilian units. No? Okay. Um, secondly, the second theme, or grand theme of this unrestricted warfare, you have the side principle structure, which actually describes the asymmetrical relationship between the principal and the subordinate. The principal, of course, are those units, the armed forces. This, uh, these are the principal uh, unit and the subordinate, you have the fishing militias. Now, so that actually reflects the gray zone mm -hmm. strategy of China. In one of my respondents, Professor Peter Dutton, I don't know if he's watching right now, I hope he is watching. So he mentioned that there are, in terms of gray zone, that we could describe it into three asymmetries the asymmetry of type, so you're facing what type of asset, is it the Coast Guard, is it the Navy? No. So, and then the asymmetry of assets, of course, when you, when you look at all the sprawling fishing militias, no, more than 2,000 and then facing your Coast Guard or your Navy, no, so there's an out, an, an out how do you call it, a mismatch, I mean, of assets, or even between the, the Vietnamese 
Fishing Militias versus that of the Philippine Coast Guard, so on and so forth. So, and then the asymmetry in the application of international law and national law. One of the outcome or the implications, I mean, of let's say gray zone strategy is that it blurs the line of the zone, what, what is the zone of peace and the zone of war. So that render, no, uh, how do you call that? It blurs how we apply international law and domestic law. But this is one of the consequences of gray zone. And China is, China is exhausting that. In fact, it exhausts the white on white policy that the Philippines is actually you know, uh, operating. So if you face the Coast Guard, the Coast Guard should be faced by its counterpart. If the Navy is uh, deployed, so the Navy should be faced by a Navy. And here, you don't know who you are actually uh, facing. So that is an asymmetry. Now that's the gray zone strategy. Okay. So of course, with this gray zone strategy, you one of the one of the uh, approaches of Chinese unrestricted warfare is that it has a limited target. It uses certain restricted uh, resources, but with a huge outcome. So uh, mm. minimum cost, but maximum outcome. So this implies the civilianization of war. And then, of course, lastly, which is the important element of unrestrict, unrestricted warfare, is the supranational combination or the war beyond limits. So you have the uh, huge economy. So it actually combined international, national, and, in, uh, and supranational or non-state organizations connected by its uh, economy through the Belt and Road Initiative, its maritime and land routes. In the, in, 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 the, in, the, in Asia or even in the Indo-Pacific area. So China has this concept of Tianxia, all under heavens. That is how it, that is how it presents or it understands the international. Now modern sovereignty is just a unit that is attached to the broader concept of Tianxia, wherein the, the Chinese is the middle kingdom that regulates all affairs under the celestial empire. So that is the concept of China's international. And they use that. Okay? So these are the seven approaches to achieve those four elements or strategies, omnidirectionality, synchrony, limited objectives, asymmetry, minimal consumption, multidimensional coordination, and the adjustment and control of the entire process. So I prepared a concept map just to provide a simpler context or discussion of this so-called China's unrestricted warfare. So the main uh, compass that directs China's interest is its limited target, which is the South China Sea. So they are concentrated with that. And concentration is power for the Chinese. So with that, no, they combined uh, all strategies and under this combination of strategies, you have omnidirectionality, one of the approaches of unrestricted warfare that designs to observe, design, and combine all resources in war fighting. But of course, you have the fishing militias, you have the five dragons, and then the use of civilian assets by the Chinese Navy. Okay, so omnidirectionality aimed to uh, focus on the target without leaving uh, any blind spot. No? And then you have the side principle structure, which I actually discussed earlier, and it implies the asymmetry that leads us to other uh, approaches, minimal consumption of resources, because they have to combine military and non-military assets in the battlefield, both civilian assets and military assets are now of equal footing in the battlefield. And with that, they use unlimited measures to achieve their target. And with this, it blurs, again, like what I said, zones of peace and war. Okay, and then lastly, we have, I mean, this is the third one, we have sub supranational combination, which again refers to other three approaches in this particular strategy. The synchrony, synchrony meaning you have to achieve one target in a specific time, but in different places. Mm -hmm. You can only achieve this by deploying all these assets and combining both non-military and military zones. Multi-dimensional coordination, the coordination, of course, of these units, 
military and non-military units and the adjustment and the control of the entire process because this is something <clears throat> new at some point uh, this in engine ingenious uh, approach by the chinese they need to control all uh how do you call that uh, circumstance or consequences of this particular approach so there are three domains or there are three levels the supra domain so the domain of or the battlefield you have gray zone military and non-military supra tier combination which is the use of all political cultural economic through the belt and road initiative and supra means you have information and then you have uh the civilian units and this lead to one implications the civilianization of war and then all this concept all this this uh, strategic framework targets to one limited target which is the south china sea but like what i said it has huge implications for regional security particularly amongst direct stakeholders in asean the philippines for example okay so if you are familiar with sun Tzu, now he said that subduing an enemy without necessarily uh, fighting the enemy in this case subduing an enemy with clever limited but with all you no know, resources available so that's ch how china thinks okay so we're now moving to the u.s indo-pacific strategy what is the role now of the indo-pacific strategy strategy mm -hmm. in this uh, strategic approach of the chinese okay so First, you have uh, five major objectives of uh, the U.S. Indo-Pacific to advance a free and open Indo-Pacific that will that will ensure that all state members in the region protect and uh, uphold the rule of law, and to protect the freedom of navigation, build connections within and beyond the region. The United States believe that its asymmetrical force is its network of alliance and partners in the region. So that is one of their leverages in countering this unrestricted warfare. Thirdly, is to drive regional prosperity under the Indo-Pacific economic framework to build a resilient uh, uh, economy, clean, resilient, fair uh, economy. And then bolster Indo-Pacific strategy from Secretary Ratner. He said that force posturing and uh, uh, the strengthening of the network of alliances and partners in the Indo-Pacific is one way to bolster the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy in uh, the region, particularly protecting the security, original security, you know, and then build regional resi uh, resiliency against transnational threats like terrorism, cyber threats, and other sources of threats like uh, in the environment or health security threats that will actually affect regional peace and security. So this is now a framework I prepared to just understand further the Indo-Pacific strategy. So the Indo-Pacific strategy started, uh, it starts with, of course, the whole government approach with its allies and partners, actually to integrate uh, a, an effective deterrence in the region. This could be achieved by firstly, campaigning with allies and partners. And secondly, building enduring advantage in the region. By campaigning with its allies and partners, it will legitimize the goals of the Indo-Pacific Command. So you have the protection of the mainland, the United States or the homeland, and then the protection of regional peace and security against adversaries. Mm -hmm. And of course, to expose and legitimate actions coming from adversaries. And then for, to, to build an enduring advantage, the United States has to achieve a capability overmatch through a through its network of allies and partners. And the Philippines is one of those. Okay, and then the transformation of a maritime power in the Indo-Pacific strategy. So all this will lead us to one of the approach that the, in, the US Indo-Pacific has to counter low fare, that is to expose uh, 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 illegal actions and to protect the rule of law and to encourage partnership between states and non-state actors particularly the academia no and then to strengthen the network of alliance through the quad philippines mutual defense treaty uh, thailand japan score so on and so forth and this will lead us to an enduring free and open indo-pacific 
So this strategy it, it operates within a multi-domain, meaning in times of peace and war, or particularly in all threats that will lead to or that will transition to our, an armed conflict, all weather, meaning uh, environmental issues, climate change, health, like the pandemic, uh, all environment issues that will prevail in high and low intensity conflict. Okay, so um, areas of cooperation between the Philippines in this case and that of the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy, moreover, a cosmopolitan humanist approach. So firstly, when you refer to counter law, I don't know what's wrong with my, with my presentation, but anyway, um, one of my respondents mentioned that counter lawfare actually is, uh, one of my respondents mentioned that he, he said, I mean, like counter lawfare relies heavily, and the success of counter lawfare relies heavily on the management of information. So when you gather information, it has, of course, to be real-time information for us to establish an effective multi, uh, I mean, a, a, a maritime domain awareness. But the question here is what kind of information? It's reliability and accuracy, like in the case of the alleged military laser incident. So what is the trajectory? What is the goal? How would you like the people to react to that? Now, how would you like Chinese to react to that? Is the Philippines ready to that? Particularly, the Filipinos are not intellectually mature in the consumption of information. So that is one of the questions. And the United States could help us improve this you know, strategy, counter lawfare, via the UN Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, the consumption of information is very important in an effective counter lawfare. So, secondly, strong, credible maritime domain awareness. I already mentioned that real-time information because this is really one of the problems. Uh, how to get uh, accurate and current uh, information. So, there has to be a more, uh, how do you build, effective network between uh, civilian and armed force. I'm referring to the Coast Guard and the Navy. Okay? And the network of state and non-state units. So apart from the coast where this maritime enforced view, I also refer to fishing communities, no? To upgrade or improve the Bantay Dagat program. The Philippines during the 90s, we have the 80s, 90s, we have the Bantay Dagat program. So fishermen. They could be an asset particular to not only to not only as reconnaissance unit, but they could also help us protect, you know, our maritime uh, areas. Okay. So this is more of a people-centered policies that is referred to or that is proposed by the scholar Mary Caldor in his in her concept of new war. Thirdly, is to enhance existing legal maritime initiatives or policies and capacity building programs or standard operating procedures. We have the queues. However, the Philippines, I think, is not a, a partner of the queues. If I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong. Later, perhaps Professor Van Lowy will help you with that. Uh, we have the ship rider agreement, but we, the Philippines, I mean the Coast Guard may have that once with Japan, but uh, after that we don't have uh, other progress or initiatives that could help us improve uh, Coast Guarding or even maritime policing, especially that involves, of course, civilians. Fishing communities, because they are the primary or the direct stakeholders of these particular issues. And then, of course, the upgrading of the Philippines' uh, rules of engagement and the rules of the use of uh, the use of force. So this ha there, there is a, there is a need to rethink this. Either to combine this, you know, so one or two, uh, the first two chapters would be the RUE, RUF, and then the second and the third chapter would be something that will address gray zone campaigns or unrestricted warfare. Because at the moment, I think. I'm not so sure, so perhaps there is a need for the government, especially our maritime and for the Philippine maritime and forces to address this. And then strengthen people to people diplomacy. Most of the programs, they always uh, accommodate scholars, intellectual elites like most of us here. I think there is a uh, there is a, th this is a high time to also involve the narratives of the fishing communities mm -hmm. because they are the direct, like, direct stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So in cosmopolitan humanism, the approach is to put 
the individual in the core of all policy making, either if it's Indo-Pacific strategy, Belt and Road Initiative, or even in all the rules of you know engagement, so on and so forth, uh, coming from the Philippines side, because they are the direct stakeholders. Like in this case, we are talking, but only amongst us. We consume this information, but how about those who are in Bajo de Masinlo or in Pag-asa Island. And I think this is a high time. I've been telling my colleagues and friends from the Chinese embassy and some colleagues from China to involve fishing uh, fishing communities and also on the China, the United States side to involve fishing communities, especially that they need to, you know, uh, incorporate the experiences, improve fishing practices, and to, that that could lead us to the, the to improve maritime governance and of course protection and that's one way to empower our fishing communities i am from a family of fishermen in my hometown in mati city it's a coastal beautiful city that's why i have a heart to really you know speak about maritime security and that's one way to contribute to my community no so to sum up with my presentation there are actually four uh points you have information communication that could help us in an effective counter lawfare and of course to center individual rights in all policy response that we have to address let's say unrestricted warfare so china's rights is actually inevitable we are in the era that china is rising there is no way to control there's no way to address that. How are we going to respond to, to, to China's rise? That's the most crucial thing. And as we respond to China, it has to be centered, or it has to be people-centered, no? or individual rights-centered, not necessarily tied to blocks that is defined heavily by territoriality and sovereignty. It has to be centered to the people. Of course, I am not saying that the state is absolute, because let's say, state maybe or the or legal policies may be rendered uh, obsolete in the case of new war but the state is an enabling unit here to promote individual rights in the core of all policy response toward unrestricted warfare gray zone campaigns not only by china but this could be done by you know other states russia israel no so I think uh, this is something that we need to ponder on. Okay, that ends my presentation. Daghan salamat. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morales. That was really fascinating. And I, I particularly appreciate the approach you took towards the South China Sea issue from a Philippine perspective and put it into some larger context of new war, unrestricted warfare, and the end of the six strategy. Um, I, I, I think I liked your concept maps. Uh, I would urge you to think about linking your kind of proposed solutions to this cosmopolitan humanist approach to the earlier concept. Yeah. Uh, because I think you'll draw clearer lines between how this individual and fishing community and information elements speak to or or react to those new warfare and unrestricted a uh, new war and unrestricted warfare elements that you highlighted uh, uh, earlier so um and i would just say to this audience because of the nature of this u.s philippine next generation security fellows program that one of our next participants in the program will be giving a talk soon is commander jay Jarella, who is in the philippine uh, coast guard and he'll be coming here uh, soon um and he and i had a chance to be on one of the uh, Coast Guard ships recently in the Philippines, and uh, he'll be coming here and talk, talking both from a very practitioner basis, but also from the basis of his knowledge and work uh, in this area. So uh, with that, I uh, really appreciated your presentation. Looking forward to the final publication. And now we turn to our good friend, Ramel Benaloy. Uh, Ramel, over to you, sir. Just one moment, Ramel. I think we're not getting your audio. He's muted. Oh, oh can you just prop, you're muted, bro. Yeah. Still muted. Jesus, thank you. 
There's inevitably some tech issues. Oh, okay, that's a good idea. Right now, Rommel. It's a hundred. So it's Hello. up to there we go. Rommel. Thank you, Rommel. Yes, we can, Ronald. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay, then we do. Okay, Off you go. For the kind invitation. It's great and, to see you. Uh, I truly miss your company. It's been a long time since I think we, we last met in Manila. Yes, I have. Anyway, uh, good morning to everybody and good night here in the Philippines. Almost midnight here. <laughs> but uh, I'm here because of the love of Satu and Risan. And I'm truly really, I'm really proud of uh, Risan, particularly her current uh, intellectual achievement. Uh, but uh, let me share my thoughts on her presentation by presenting what I call an outlier view of China's new war through unrestricted warfare in the South China Sea and discuss this in the context of the U.S. in the Pacific strategy, but only very briefly. But there is a conventional wisdom arguing that the People's Republic of China, led by the Chinese Communist Party, is preparing for war against the world. The use of so-called unrestricted warfare is arguably China's strategic mantra to defeat adversaries and win battles against opponents, preferably without actual fighting. Like our forum today, that kind of warfare is a hybrid form of warfare. Unrestricted warfare is a hybrid form of warfare using military and non-military measures to achieve victory in battles using all available resources, political, economic, sociocultural, legal, environmental, informational, and technological. There's nothing new about this hybrid method. This so-called new war has already been practiced during the ancient times what is new is its application to new situations, new technologies, new battlefields, new players with new intentions. But based on my personal survey of existing literature, unrestricted warfare is being used by others to mean new warfare, irregular warfare, asymmetric warfare, gray zone warfare, and the like. In its current practice, however, unrestricted warfare is solely associated with China's grand strategy in its march towards so-called world domination, mm -hmm. especially in the context of China's competition with major powers, particularly with the United States. China is also accused of using unrestricted warfare to assert China's sovereignty or even impose control of Tibet, Xinjiang, Taiwan, and even South China and East China Seas. In my more than 30 years of studying China, particularly its security policy, foreign affairs, and military development, I consider this conventional wisdom on China's unrestricted warfare as ethnocentric, meaning ethnocentric for being biased in support of Western perspective, which in the context of China's growing power is simplistic and ideologically motivated rather than scholarly driven. The popular Western narrative of China's unrestricted warfare is creating an image of China that is posing a serious threat to the world. The United States in the Pacific strategy is upholding this narrative by declaring China as a threat along with Russia, Iran, and North Korea. Since this forum is about the application of China's unrestricted warfare in the South China Sea, let us then focus on this issue. There is no doubt that China is conducting military and paramilitary activities in the South China Sea to advance its national interests. Mm. These activities are due to be part of China's application of unrestricted warfare in the South China Sea. But if we observe closer, the many activities happening in the South China Sea region 
other parties like Vietnam, Malaysia, Taiwan, Brunei, and even the Philippines are also doing the same, but not as soon as China for obvious reasons. But the world clearly notices China's activities because it is the big elephant in the room. In fact, China's activities are now too obvious not to be noticed, especially by major powers like the U.S., the champion of freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. China's activities in the South China Sea are being interpreted not only in the context of territorial disputes and even maritime jurisdictional conflicts. China's actions in the South China Sea is also being viewed within the frame of major power competition, not only in Asia, but also in the wider in the Pacific region. To contend that China is preparing for war in the South China Sea is just looking at one side of the coin. In the context of U.S.-China major power, major power rivalry, China indeed is preparing military to defend its interests in major flashpoints of conflict in Asia involving the United States, the Korean Peninsula, the Taiwan Strait, and the South China Sea, and let's include the East China Sea. But in my experiences interact, interacting with various think tanks in China and South and Southeast Asia that are involved in South China Sea issues, China is one of its China is one with its Southeast Asian neighbors to prepare for peace in the South in the South China Sea. And that is the other side of the coin, peace in the South China Sea and not war. Mm. Chinese and Southeast Asian scholars and many experts want peace, not war in the South China Sea. In fact, I have participated in countless international conferences in China to discuss how to promote pragmatic cooperation, blue economy, good ocean governance, conflict avoidance, and preventive diplomacy in the South China Sea. When China and members of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations signed the declaration of the conduct of parties in the South China Sea in November 2002, they have expressed intention to consolidate and develop the friendship and cooperation among parties in order to promote a 21st century oriented partnership of good neighborliness and mutual trust. And they even agreed to pursue pragmatic cooperation in the areas of marine environmental protection, marine scientific research, safety of navigation and communication at sea, search and rescue operation, and combating transnational crime, including but not limited to trafficking in illicit drugs, piracy, and robbery at sea, and illegal trafficking arms, as well as combating international terrorism. However, the DOC had inherent limitations in managing South China Sea conflicts because of unclear geographic scope, vague legal character, and ambiguous implementing mechanism. Parties even set this limitation upon themselves because of their own national interests. Nonetheless, the DOC paved the way, set the tone, and even framed the negotiations on the COC just to promote peace in the South China Sea. Discussions on the COC took time, but ASEAN agreed to water it down to become the DOC in 2002. But a landmark event happened in 2014 when China and ASEAN started to discuss the details of the COC and agreed to adopt the single draft negotiating text in August 2018. The adoption of the single draft negotiating text was a milestone in China-ASEAN relations in the South China Sea as they finally agreed to, to eventually conclude the COC in accordance with the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. China and Southeast Asian nations are preparing for peace in the South China Sea. However, China and ASEAN still have unresolved issues pertaining to geographic scope, mm -hmm. nature of activities to be covered, dispute settlement, the duty to cooperate, the role of third parties, and even the legal status of the COC. But my point in telling this is that when it comes to territorial disputes and maritime jurisdictional conflict in the South China Sea, China is talking with parties to adopt a peaceful approach. There is no doubt that we have issues against China on the ramification of the South China Sea disputes. Parties in the South China Sea disputes have different sets on their national positions. But these are not irreconcilable differences. We can, in fact, manage our differences through consultations and negotiations and not through military competition. I think China's military preparation in the South China Sea is not mainly about territorial disputes or maritime jurisdictional conflicts. In my observation, it is largely about the fear of the possibility of military conflict with the United States yeah. using the South China Sea as the battleground. Mm -hmm. In my understanding, China is not preparing for war against its neighbors in the South China Sea and beyond. 
has articulated in its Global Security Initiative, China wants world peace and international security. China also wants peace for the whole world economically to develop as elaborated in its Global Development Initiative. That is why China is implementing the Belt and Road Initiative, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, and even the Shanghai Cooperation Organization to achieve peace with its neighbors through free trade and open commerce. China is also advancing the global civilizational initiatives to promote harmony rather than clash of world civilizations. However, China's current global initiatives are proposing a new global order that is threatening the existing one created by the Western world. In that context, I totally agree that China is a threat specifically to the Western world, but China is not necessarily a threat to the whole world. In my travels in various parts of the developing world, the rest of the world, particularly in the global south, regards China as an economic opportunity. But with the caveat, there are concomitant security challenges, but these security challenges can be surmounted through development cooperation rather than military competition. With that note, I want to conclude that the way ahead in the South China Sea is not war, but peace. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ronald. Um, it, it's really refreshing to have uh, these perspectives, especially from the Philippines, uh, presented here in this in this program. Because, of course, as you know, the South China Sea issue has been refracted and perceived here in particular ways. So I'm really grateful for you for bringing to the table a set of optics and a set of perspectives that are not ones that we hear particularly often and particularly good to hear them from Filipino colleagues. So I will ask you to say a little bit more about what I thought was a distinction on unrestricted warfare between the more kinetic side and the more um, non-kinetic side, which is information, et cetera. And the larger question that arises from your comments about why many, many countries that are implicated in the disputes in the South China Sea have expressed concerns about China's claims, um, not only to China, but also, of course, to the United States, the international community, um, and why the Philippines itself, for example, uh, pursued lawfare in its, um, you know, in its objection and its court filing. So, I mean, we can have lots of room to discuss. I'm afraid, as usual, we have such good presentation, thoughtful um, uh, PowerPoint that uh, we don't have enough time for discussion, but I do want to open it up and give some time. I think we have a little bit of time. And Ronald, I know it's late, but if you could stick with us for just a few minutes, I'd like to open it up to have any comments or questions from the floor. Just simple rules, because we're online uh, and being live streamed, is to identify yourself and affiliation, please. Yes, sir, you had a question or comment. Hi, I'm Christopher Ward, I'm a journalist here in DC. Uh, on the issue of information warfare, we've seen for years now China uh, pushing back against Western media, especially Hollywood studios, about how they depict the South China Sea. Like Barbie. Right. So <laughs> more recently we saw Vietnam and mm -hmm. also the Philippines criticized the depiction of in Barbie and also I think the BTS group Black Shank. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we should see those actions by Vietnam and the Philippines yeah. comparable efforts to compete in the information space to assert how they want the South China Sea issues to be depicted. Okay, that's a great question for the Folks online who may have not have heard it, uh, we don't have, uh, we're going to improve our microphone system. But the question was whether the Philippines and Vietnam's recent protests, if I understood correctly, against particular depictions of Ch South China Sea claims is their effort to counter China's information claims and on the South China Sea. Does that, so let me turn to our Filipino yeah. colleagues and Rana, would you like to comment yeah. on that? Well, yes. Yeah. Many efforts to counter that, and in fact, uh, uh, several lawmakers in the Philippines condemned the, the, the depiction of that mouth. And uh, and the Philippines is not only reacting to the mouth, but also uh, uh, reacting to China's activities in the West Philippine Sea. We have filed a lot of diplomatic protests already, and at the same time, we have mobilized the international community to condemn China's actions in the South China Sea. So uh, we are uh, we are doing a lot to, to make China know that we are not we are not approving 
its actions in the web filling bit C. Mm. Mm. Any comments from yeah, you? Yeah, I, 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 I agreed with what Professor Bangawi mentioned. In fact, we filed more than 200 protests against uh, Chinese incursion in the West Philippine Sea. However, um, there are instances in my discussion with other colleagues, Chinese colleagues, that some of this diplomatic protest, some, and but there are those, did not reach the Chinese embassy in Manila. So I think there oh. is the block in the modes of communication from the Philippine side, particularly the DFA, and their counterpart, which is the Chinese embassy in the Philippines. So there are there has to there, they need there is need to remove these bottlenecks of communication for you know a more fluid diplomatic engagement between China and the Philippines, particularly with the recent alleged military laser incident last February 2020. As, yeah. Sorry, Ms. Morales, may I just ask you, just to clarify, I had not heard about the uh, protests. What I understood is the Filipino government's filing of filing protests have, protest. have, have, have ebbed and flowed with the administration. Yeah. In, um, in no, what I've been with the recent Marcos administration that okay. they said that there has been protests or diplomatic protests. We asked people, our Chinese uh, uh, diplomats, some may have reached them, some did not reach them. Reach them in what way? They weren't actually yeah, delivered? Not, or, yeah, at some point. That, I had not heard that. That's a very interesting. Uh, but this is something that uh, I don't know. You know, I'm an outsider. I don't speak for the Philippine side. I neither speak for the Chinese side. Mm -hmm. No, but as a scholar, it is my obligation to at some point be more critical. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of my comment, uh, recommendations or in my conclusion, there has to be at, at some point a way to at some point resolve the blocks in diplomatic communication for an easier and efficient modes of you know transfer of let's say diplomatic protest mm. or conveying some disappointments mm. coming from both sides. So these are something that both states, China and the Philippines need to set up. Ronald, do you have anything on that? That's a very interesting uh, sort of uh, data point that I did not have. Uh, I've never heard that before. Please. You know, I, I am deeply involved in a lot of think tank communications with, China, my, with my Chinese counterparts. And my understanding is that it's not, there's no lack of communication among experts and scholars, but there's a lack of communication among officials. Mm. On the part of the That's Philippines, right. I think, mm. um, uh, I, I think the Philippines is not ready to communicate with China. It is my observation, my candid observation, yeah. because of the lack of our Mistress. solid national position yeah. on the South China Sea issue. We don't know what we are fighting for. In my observation, especially when I was uh, appointed the uh, designated briefly of a deputy yeah. national security advisor, I observed that many officials in the Philippines are even confused about the nature of conflicts in the South China Sea. There are two major nature of conflict in the South China Sea. Territorial conflict, which is subject to sovereignty and maritime jurisdictional yes. disputes. And many of our discussions on the West Philippines is about maritime jurisdictional disputes, but that's just one aspect of the dispute. There's another aspect of the dispute that is not being communicated properly, and that is territorial disputes. Mm -hmm. Now, if we talk about territorial disputes, we cannot communicate with China on how to advance Philippine national position on territorial disputes. But China knows how to advance its national position, even the, the nine dash line that has already been rendered uh, unlawful uh, by the International Arbitral Tribunal, uh, they still know how to advance their national position. But in the case of the Philippines, I observe that officials do not, well, do not tell the same party line when it comes to our national positions on the South China Sea disputes. So there is one aspect is the territory that the territorial dispute, which is subject to sovereignty. And it cannot be handled by the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea or even the Permanent Court of Arbitration. You know, it's yeah. Uh, but the maritime jurisdictional dispute that the, the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea can handle that. But unfortunately, what is that being known by even the larger public in the Philippines and even by scholars around the world? You know, mm -hmm. 
that uh, that the international arbitral tribunal only rendered on the aspect of maritime jurisdictional disputes in the South China Sea and not on territorial oh, disputes. Right. Right. And that is the main reason why China opted out mm -hmm. of the international arbitration process because for China, the issue is not only maritime jurisdictional disputes, the issue is territorial disputes. Who owns the land features? Mm -hmm. Now, in the Philippines, what are the land features that we that, that we are owning in the in the West Philippine Sea. There are 55 land features. Mm. One is the Scarborough Shoal and the 54 land features in the Kalayan Island Group. However, out of these 54 land features in the Kalayan Island Group, the Philippines only occupies nine land features. The rest have been occupied by other parties, 21 by Vietnam, seven by China, five by Malaysia, and mm. two are being claimed by uh, so we lost half of our territories in in the in the Kalayan Island group. And that is not being understood by many, mm. well, by many officials and even some scholars in the Philippines. And that is the context on why China rejected the international arbitration, because China is viewing the dispute in the South China Sea largely in the context of territorial disputes and not only maritime jurisdictional disputes. So if you want to settle our disputes with China, there's there's no way but to negotiate with China yeah. for a peaceful political settlement. And there would also be... <laughs> Sorry, Ravel, I didn't mean to interrupt yeah. you, of course. Uh, but it would also be, therefore, very interesting to engage more on, on the Kalyan uh, features, uh, the, the, the ones that are split between Vietnam, Brunei, and China. Yeah. Would, I, I would want to know more about how Philippines is approaching Vietnam and Brunei and Malaysia on those features as well. And what is the difference in your approach towards China versus these other set of fellow ASEAN members? Is there, have you... Well, other, part, well, other parties are members of ASEAN and for the Philippines it's been, it's very important to maintain ASEAN solidarity. And that is why we're doing quiet diplomacy when it comes to our ASEAN neighbors. Mm -hmm. We're doing quiet diplomacy with Malaysia, with Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And then the, 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 the difference with Vietnam is that we have a strategic, comprehensive strategic cooperation mm -hmm. with Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And that is why I'm also telling China to, uh, even the Philippine government, to also open the same type of strategic, comprehensive strategic cooperation with China so we will have many channels of communication to manage our mm -hmm. differences. And I, I truly agree with the with the uh, with the reason that in the Philippines now, right now, there is the lack of channels of communi uh, channel of communication. Uh, but I, I, I see positive developments recently now yeah. because Ambassador Wang Chilian of China Ambassador to the Philippines uh, met uh, Secretary Del Tudoro and they started talking about the resumption of Asian Defense and Security Talks to so we'll talk about uh, the South China disputes and also uh strengthen military to military relations between between china and and the philippines because it's the weakest part of the relationship between the two countries okay. you know uh and at the same time the the port the department of foreign affairs and the ministry of foreign affairs of china are now talking about the fact the, the the resumption of the bilateral consultative mechanism in the south china sea mm -hmm. however there is a major obstacle towards the resumption of these channels of communication. Mm -hmm. China is very worried and very suspicious of the Philippines' decision to allow the expansion of locations for the enhanced defense cooperation agreement with the United States. And that is the context on why, you know, things are difficult between China and the Philippines yeah. now when it comes to the issue of the South China Sea. Mm. Well, before we get to that, I, because that's a whole range of issues about whether that gives Philippines more leverage in the discussions with China or less leverage in the discussions with China. Well, I want to take up another question. Is there, Are there any more hands? I'd like to take all questions at once. So we have Vivan Chu Shaker and we have um, Lance Jackson from our team Lance. here. So these two questions, let's take them at once. If you could respond and let's wrap up then in about... Three to five minutes, please. Uh, with Anshu, American University, I had a question. There was a, a discussion about single draft texting of uh, uh, China ASEAN COC. Mm -hmm. 
So, could someone like you know you or like the discussant uh, enlighten uh, me on uh, what exactly it means the single draft text? Does it mean like uh, China is negotiating single draft text with each ASEAN member, like you know, a party to the dispute, or is it uh, does it mean like there is a single ASEAN document that a... all the parties involved are just yeah. uh, are uh, negotiating? It's the last or the second part, like you know, uh, of that is uh, what is the current status on the single draft text of ASEAN? Uh, okay, so let's put that on the table. Single draft text. What does it mean? What's the status? Lance Jackson. Uh, in this discussion, we've been talking about, uh, both of you have talked about kind of this individualization of this conflict, but I would like to juxtapose that to uh, what Dr. Rommel had mentioned uh, before about the this actual kind of ideological conflict uh, between, um, you know, the nature of the international system uh, that China is challenging and that America is trying to reinforce. So. Basically, uh, you know, we in this discussion, we both you've asked both sides to to focus on this individual mm. level. But is there an individual state at that in in this conflict uh, between these two ideologies? So the material gain at the end of the day is and, and what do you think there, there is opinion? Have they pick sides? Is it just relevant about who can give me the most at this moment? And that's far off. From the individual level so that's my question thank you lance so who wants to go first Rob. and you're our main presenter so you can close the session yes yeah. rama you got the two questions well i can answer the first question okay yeah the status of the negotiation on the photo plan of the south china sea uh supposedly this this year uh they, they should finish this year the second reading of the single draft negotiating text. Okay. They should finish this year. And then when they finish the second reading, then they should go to the third reading to finally conclude the code of conduct. But there is a timeline that was not meant. You know, the, the, the negotiation, the conclusion must happen this year. Mm -hmm. But at the at the rate they are talking about details of the single draft negotiating text. I am not very uh, optimistic that they'll be able to conclude this year, but at least they should conclude the second reading this year, especially uh, in the forthcoming uh, China ASEAN uh, summit. Okay. Uh, just to add to Wait. the point of Professor Bandawi, sir, your question, the COC is addressed to all members okay. of the ASEAN. It's not per individual state member, but uh, it started with the DOC, the declaration, and then now with the COC, and it's in its first reading. So it is applied to all members of the Association for Southeast Asian Nations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. And just to add, Prof, uh, Doc, earlier with what we mentioned, how we deal with Vietnam, mm -hmm. how we deal with. Uh, in the case, for example, of fishing militias, our military, our, our, our enforcers, the Coast Guard and Navy, they treat them as, how do you call it, illegal fishermen. Uh, it's not actually most of the fishing militias are not actually Chinese, but the dominant are Vietnamese. It's just that, like what Professor Banawi, China's uh, image has been the most visible, mm -hmm. and with this, it's easier to like put China on that how do you call it, uh, status wherein he or China is the aggressor. But uh, in reality, issues concerning fishing militias illegal fishermen that actually uh, cross within our exclusive economic zones, most of which are actually Vietnamese. Yeah. This is something that is inevitable, you know, because these areas are traditional fishing ground. Mm. And the South China Sea or even the West Philippine Sea with it are easy, it's a public good. It's a maritime good, so it has to be accessible to all. But the thing is that most of these fishing militias are illegal uh, poachers and they actually destroy maritime areas that actually is a threat to the food security threatening the coral triangle in the south china sea so how we treat them it's equal to like treating an illegal fisherman mm -hmm. either if it's japan uh, either it's chinese or vietnamese it's mostly it's vietnamese mm -hmm. it's just that we focus on china so much right and that same impact on the yes. fisherman communities yes, of course. the philippines yes same impact yeah. and that's why yeah i think that there's also like what i said there's a need to improve 
these qualities to really protect and empower the fishing communities. Mm -hmm. And Prof, with regard to like uh, land as question uh, on the individual, I don't understand actually the question of uh, land. Lance, you want to refine your question a little bit for me, son? <laughs> well, I, I think you just touched on it. It's, it's, you were talking about illegal fishing. So that's okay. a, a, a thing that mm -hmm. affects it. And you were talking about how China would solve this very individualistic problem oh. with negotiations, but you talk about the U.S. approach to it, you know, rule of law. So uh, my idea is just like, so do, is there a, as long as we can get the outcome that we want on the individual level, does it matter, this ideological conflict of, you know, the international order and, and what, okay. where it's being challenged? Yeah, I think that, uh, Prof, please allow me first, and then you could uh, support my answer. <laughs> anyway, so I think that is a, a multi-layer question Lance has at the international, I'm sorry, at the international level and even at the regional or even at the national domain, you know. But with regard to how China at some point is committed in the protection of maritime areas, China has this cooperation with ASEAN in 2015, the ASEAN Maritime Blueprint. And it's actually one of the basis for the creation of the blue governance and maritime protection that actually is one of the pillars of the Belt and Road Initiative. So China has actually involved itself in so many initiatives that empower fishing communities. But to put this in realization, it is, of course, a long practice to, you know, to deal with fishing communities. But China has a lot of efforts, you know, maritime governance, Blue Ocean uh, Governance, these are all the initiatives China has that deals with fishing community. But at some point at the regional or at the international level, it looks at the matter of a more political, high political issues concerning, let's say, maritime and territorial security. But China has, this is what I've been telling with uh, Chinese uh, diplomats or Chinese colleagues, that to deal further to strengthen more on public on its public diplomacy that deal with direct stakeholders, which of course are the fishing communities. Now, so uh, in that 2015, I'm not so sure of its update. I, I've asked some of the one of the respondents I have in this particular study uh, from the NISDSS, the Institute of, uh, of South China Sea Studies in Hainan, but they say they are still. It's an ongoing project that they commit that they they tried to commit with uh, ASEAN members, with the ASEAN plus uh, ASEAN and China maritime cooperation. So they have this initiatives. I don't know, Prof, uh, perhaps you have other response to Lance's question. Thank you for not having my member here. Yes. Ravel, any thoughts? Well, mix, you know, mixed reactions from in, individual people, individual persons. But largely, uh, they don't care about ideology. Mm. They uh, initially because they want economic development. Mm. They like yeah. removing people out of poverty, including the fishermen and even the farmers. You know. But this is my observation. When you become richer, I observe that many, many rich, richer people in China, they want to transfer to the Philippines because when you got richer, you are, you know, looking for greater freedom. Freedom they cannot enjoy in China, but freedom that they enjoy in the Philippines. So that is the kind of uh, observations now in my interaction with the Taiwan. Now I'm talking with a lot of Chinese wanting to stay for good in the Philippines because after being rich, they want to become free. <laughs> freedom that they cannot enjoy in China. But that's the nature of political system in China. That's why China is also doing some political reforms on how to make them after you know it is the narrative of china they remove out of poverty at 800 million people and that is a service to the humanity but from these 800 million people there are like 200 million people wanting more freedom <laughs> so if you want more freedom china said if you want more freedom better go to taiwan <laughs> yeah. Yeah. or better go yeah. to the philippines or hong kong asking yeah. for freedom Okay, you leave home yes, home and yes, you leave yes, elsewhere. Yes, but I, I think that's the that's the, the I think that's the puzzle now that we need to uh, uh, study now. 
because but based on my parents observations uh, uh they don't they don't matter about ideology mm -hmm. if you're poor thank you, know, you. Ideology doesn't matter if you're poor you just want to be well to be economically well off but when you're well off already then ideology can come in because you want greater people thank you Ramel. thanks very much Let's give the last word. Uh, Risa, could you wrap up, please? Uh, thank, give you. Up thank you. Thank uh, you, Dr. Limay. Thank you, Professor Mokbalawi. I think, you know, it comes to ideology. The primary ideology of China is prosperity and practically practical ways to achieve prosperity and development. China, personally, are very entrepreneurial uh, people. You know, um, In the 20th Party Congress speech of Xi Jinping, he mentioned or he emphasized on social development and economic prosperity as basis for its uh, Chinese dream. But of course, this Chinese dream is of Chinese characteristics. And this Chinese characteristics he is trying to, uh, is attempting to like, he attempts to display to the world is the loyalty to the state that is run by the CCP. So if you want to be richer, and of course there's kind of allegiance to the CCP. If you want more freedom, like Professor Banal, you go outside China. Mm. So I think uh, that ends our presentation. But of course, like what I said in, in my discussion earlier, as we attempt to face the, you know, the, the how do you call it, the changing uh, direction of the international system, we need to at some point put individual rights as the core of all response towards whether China's rights, all other issues concerning new wars and unrestricted warfare and even uh, high conflict uh, or armed insurgencies, particularly in the Middle East or in South Asia. And that ends our presentation. Daghan Salamat. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Ronald. And it's uh, way past midnight, almost 1 or 2 a.m. Morning. Yeah, good morning to you and thank you so much for joining us. Look forward to seeing you in Manila in a few months' time. And Risan, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. all of you for joining us and for those of you online, we bid you good day.